or a, a feeling. And so here, I think we're getting again, the seed of, you know, we had talked about in kindergarten chats, uh, Sullivan kept repeating this idea that behind every building is the man, is the person. And now we're getting, I believe, the seed of this idea that every building has to have a life of its own. And as we're thinking about the ornament, that just as a life needs to have integrity, that in the same way that the building has to have this integrity by springing from the same source of feeling. And again, this idea of connecting the architecture to the feeling and connecting it with that feeling that arises from nature. And then I think that even takes us into the last article that we read for today. And here the problem is this problem of the emotion and the intellect as it pertains to architecture, the problem of the subjective and the objective. And we saw in kindergarten chats how at that point Sullivan has, you know, he, he goes into more detail about, and we, we had talked there about how his view of subjective and objective is really thinking even more about the spiritual and the material and how we need to have both of these together. And here I see that we already have the seeds of this idea as he's, he's trying to figure out this problem. And one of the things that I pulled out here was that I loved how he even pulled out the, the, the different concepts that are going to come up again and again, we know in the mature work where he, he talks about imagination and thought and again, expression and how these are these powers to, to use his other favorite phrase that we're going to need to combine in order to have both the objective and the subjective. And that, as he says here, this line that I love that thus art comes to life, thus life comes into art. And again, how there has to be both of these together, the, that there is this, uh, you know, this link between art and life that, that can't be sundered. Um, and I just marked again here, you know, another way in which he's thinking about how uh, subjectivity and objectivity have to come together. I have a passage here where he says, unless therefore subjectivity permeate an artwork, that work cannot aspire to greatness. For whatever of imagination, of thought, and of expression it may possess, there as such will remain three separate things, not three phases of one thing. An artist must necessarily, therefore, remain a more or less educated hand worker, a more or less clever sophisticator, a more or less successful framer of compromises, unless when he was born, there was born with him a hunger for the spiritual, for all other craving avails as not. Unless as a child with that marvelous instinct given only to children, he has heard the voice of nature murmuring in the woodland or a field or seaward, no after hearing can avail to catch this revelation. And thus it is that subjectivity and objectivity, not as two separate elements, but as two complementary and harmonious phases of one impulse have always constituted and will always constitute the embodied spirit of art. So again, I hear, I see here just another seed of what we know is gonna blossom into the full mature Sullivan. This idea of having again to connect to nature, whether it is in the woods or a field or in the sea and having that connection with nature, having that deep emotional feeling connection with nature and then combining the subjective with the objective that they have to come together harmoniously so that you can have a spirit of art that is embodied in the architecture. So those were the, the main passages that I wanted to pull out, but then I would just, you know, even as we maybe turn to questions, would love to hear maybe what other people think about this big abstraction that we learned about every problem uh, suggests and contains its own solution and maybe how we see some examples of that through the problems that Sullivan is tackling here. Uh, thank you, thank you, Julia. Um, let the record show that this is the second meet up in a row that somebody else other than Maritza brought up threes. <laughs> uh, next up is going to be Rupali. Thank you. Um, so, you know, as people talk, I have to move my markers because everybody takes up all the passages I've marked. I'm going to repeat a few, uh, but 
I would say, you know, in these four essays, the idea about America, and we can see throughout kindergarten chats um, how passionate Louis Sullivan is with the idea of uh, democracy, of individual uh, thought, and of expression of that thought in a um, way that is related to nature, that draws inspiration from nature. And you can see those themes in these four uh, essays. One of the things that um, I wanted to talk about uh, is what Rob pointed out before, is the responsibility of the architect of leading the public and sometimes following the public. And it brought to me the phrase from Montessori and throughout kindergarten chats, I've talked about uh, kindergarten chats through the lens of an educator and as a Montessori educator. And in Montessori, we have this phrase called follow the child. Now, it doesn't mean you follow the child till they fall off the cliff, right? You can't do that. Um, but follow the child really means that you know the potential of the child. You know where the child can reach. But the child will show interests along the way. And you follow those interests to lead them to the path. There's no one set path to get to the potential, to develop a child's potential. Similarly, I feel in this phrase um, that um, you have to, architecture is a living art that you have to take in what's going on around you. The, and when he says, follow the public, he's saying, what is going on around in America, in the idea of America? And is architecture showing that? What is that exalted uh, idea of great architecture that America could produce? And so I'm gonna read this passage again about what the architect may be. And he, later in kindergarten chat, um, chats, he does describe the role of the architect in many ways. Uh, but here it says, Harass through, harass though the architect may be by the cares and responsibilities of his daily life, there exists nevertheless within him in the midst of this turmoil and insuppressible yearning towards the ideals. So again, knowing what humans are capable of and knowing that we can actually achieve those without necessarily copying what's happened in the past is what he's trying to say. Ideal thought and effective action should so compose the vital substance of our works that they may live with us and after us as record of our fit fitness and a memorial to the good that we may have done. So um, then in the second chapter and uh, the second essay, oops, sorry about that. In the second essay, I think that essay was, um, it, it spoke to me the most, uh, much like what Mar Maritza said, because in that and throughout all these four uh, essays, Louis Sullivan talks about learning from nature and what nature um, can offer to us humans. And he says, you know, uh, when we're talking about the details to the mass, in kindergarten chats, we learned about, you know, how he looks at the whole mass and the details as a part of the whole. So looking at the big picture and then arriving at that. And he says in this chapter where, you know, you look at nature, look at leaves, look at flowers, look at a branch. Um, all of them have the details. They have the details of texture, of color, of um, various elements, um, geometry, and they all work in harmony with the big idea of the, the plant, whether it is the elm tree or the oak tree or uh, a vine, um, it, it is that big idea. So uh, in this, he says, um, Finally, assuming that the question is local, the question of what is just subordination in architecture design of details to the mass, uh, he says. Finally, assuming that the question is local and specific in its imports and calls for merely an individual expression of opinion as to what it is today and here in Chicago, the just subordination of details to mass. I, willingly make such an explanation as I may. And he goes on to explain, I do not specific, 
I do not especially believe in subordination of detail in so far as the word subordination conveys an idea of caste or rank. So with, with the involved suggestion of greater force suppressing a lesser. So the mass and the details, they go hand in hand. There's no Im, uh, imbalance between them. But I do believe in the differentiation of the detail from the mass. And we've seen this in the past when, um, Sherry, you've shown us many buildings where you've shown, you know, the, there's the big skyscraper and then the details that separate the mass to show where is the entrance, where is the upper level and the functions that follow those. Um, about nature, he goes on to say, um, let me just go to that. Uh, he goes on to say, in a building of a single germinal impulse or idea, which shall permeate the mass and its every detail with the same spirit, to such an extent, indeed, that it would be as difficult to determine, not surely as a matter of arithmetical ratio, but rather a factor in the total complex impression on the beholder, which is more important, which is in fact subordinates detail or mass, as it would be difficult to say of a tree, which is more important, which is more to us, the leaves or the trees. So the building comes together as a whole not as parts, you have to be able to take in the whole building. The other part about this, um, and I've been part of some of the Tao Te Ching um, meetups, and I've, you know, the other part about spirituality that he talks about, uh, and Maritza, you emphasize that quite well about, I value spiritual results only. And the thing is when, a building is thought through with um, imagination with the materials that would work harmoniously. He talks about the local use of materials um, and not just importing ideas, but speaking to what the people are of that area. And when you have all of those elements working in, in harmony, you can feel that spirituality within the building. And he says, um, you know, here he says, I am immersed in nature here with fellow men that we are all striving after something which we do, do not now possess, that there is an inscrutable power permeating all and the cause of all. So again, he is showing us that there is much more for us to achieve. We haven't yet gotten there. And we are going to get there through our uh, work and through our uh, exercises in getting better and better. And then he goes back to nature. Um, this is why I say that contemplation of nature and humanity is the only source of inspiration. And without that inspiration, there can be no such thing as coordination of mass and detail. So that brings us to the uh, next essay on ornamentation. And again, he's talking about, you know, what is the quintessential um, American style? Because um, Sherry, you did a fantastic job of pointing out the starkness of the concrete masses in Europe. Um, and, you know, we have some Le Cousier buildings in India and uh, it makes, you know, you don't see the difference between whether it was in Europe or India. It, it just has the same bare concrete and it has its beauty in itself. Um, I uh, don't uh, disagree with that, but what Louis Sullivan is saying is, you know, uh, when we have a country like America where there is so much potential and where we have this ideal of an individual with freedom, an individual who can dream, this is the only place he says where you can dream and make an architecture possible uh, of those ideals. So uh, in all places in the world, this is one place. Let me just find that. He says, America is the only land in the whole earth wherein a dream like this may be realized. For here alone, tradition is without shackles and the soul of man free to grow, to mature, to seek his own. But then he says, for this, we must turn to nature again. And hearkening to her melodious 
voice, learn as children learn, the accent of its rhythmic cadence. We shall learn from this to consider man and his ways to the end that we behold the unfolding of the soul in all its beauty and know that the fragrance of all living art shall float again in the garden of our world. Um, and he goes on in his um, fourth essay on emotional architecture as compared with the intellectual. I'm going to um, keep with the theme of nature. Uh, I think everybody else has highlighted other elements. And in here, he talks about the beginnings of, you know, he, the powers of man that uh, Joya pointed out about imagination, inspiration, uh, developing thought, developing the ability to think clearly or using values. Uh, what's, what is our value as we create our art? Uh, and then finally expressing it and that's the action that every architect has to take. So what is that art? And uh, when it is in harmony, that's when you, you can actualize a building that, um, that is appealing. So he says, um, by this time, know that human nature has now become too rich in its possessions, too well equipped, too magnificently endowed, that for any hitherto architecture, can be said to have hinted at its resources, much less to have exhausted them by anticipation. In this consciousness, this pride that shall be our motive, our friend, philosopher and guide in this beautiful country that stretches so invitingly before us. So we have at our disposal, um, all of these resources, all of these materials and the freedom to, to build and to, create, that true art springing fresh from nature must have in it to live much of, much of the glance of an eye, much of the sound of a voice, much of the life of, of a life. That nature is strong, generous, comprehensive, fickens, subtile, uh, subtile, that in growth and decadence, she continues, continually sets through the drama of man's life. And he talks about all of these emotions as part of seasons in uh, man's life. And he does that beautifully in kindergarten chats. Uh, so I think with that, um, I'll just end that, you know, nature provides us with all inspiration to create. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Rupali. All right, folks. So uh, now if um, we can now go to the Q&A section. Uh, go ahead and ask uh, questions. You can go ahead and type exclamation mark uh, if you have a question or raise your hand in Zoom. And if any of the panelists have questions for other panelists, they can also line up too. So go ahead and type exclamation mark for, for questions. Um, I want to start by asking, you know, following up on a question that Maritza raised yesterday. You know, we were talking about this idea of I thou, which is kind of a almost like a metaphysical spiritual relationship. And um, me, it, which is a more kind of utilitarian, transformative kind of a relationship. And like most people were thinking of them as being kind of either or. And Marisa's point was, you know, what is the flow between them? And I think Louis Sullivan actually solves that problem really well because he's going between like function and form. So function is, you know, what it is and what it is trying to do and form is how you're expressing it. And you're trying to express the form in a way which allows the function to function even better. So you're, there is this kind of loop, continuous loop going on between that. So if anybody else has any thoughts uh, or Maritza, what's, what, what's your comment on that? Uh, and anybody else who wants to say anything on that? And then it'll be Tom. Go ahead, Maritza. Um, so it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because I did, um you know, see that when reviewing today, I, I can totally see that um, it does tie in very well with the notion. It's just the, this concept of, it's like we have to train our minds to remember that so many aspects in life are not an either or. Um, the, uh, so the, the, the I thou from yesterday was talking about the importance of relations, uh, dealing with relations on a subject to subject basis. 
as opposed to a subject to object. And um, it's a, you know, I was looking at it from a perspective of, well, this is a call to um, seeking the authentic within all things. And that's, I mean, that's exactly what um, Sullivan is saying. And he actually takes it one further by pointing out to us that nature is the authentic in all things. And um, that's what I see. And the, the beauty there is, is the, um, the need for a symbiotic relationship with nature. And we can see throughout history that we have kind of waged war with nature. Like, you know, we have treated nature as this thing that must be tamed or held at bay. And I really like this concept that, you know, we, we will be the richer for finding a way instead to work in harmony with nature in all aspects. You know, when I'm saying we're kind of fighting it, beating it back, that's, you know, very simplistic view of nature, but he's talking all encompassing nature. And um, I think that it's just, we really do it. Yesterday pointed out to me how easy and naturally it's become for us to be stuck in an either or mentality. And I really love that, um, you know, every, almost every aspect, everything that he writes, Sullivan is telling us that it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, not only does it not have to be that way, it's not actually that way. <laughs> this exists whether or not you acknowledge it. So do yourself a favor and acknowledge it. And that's what I, I like about that. Excellent. Uh, thank, thanks, Maritza. Next up is Tom. Tom, uh, give me just a second. Let me just make sure. Uh, yes, uh, go ahead, Tom. Okay. Yeah, I'm having a problem with the fact that uh, the statement that the solution is in the problem. Uh, I, I, I'm very interested in the idea of good problem statements help us develop the solutions we want, but the solutions seem largely not to be in the problem statement or the problem. They seem to be in our imagination, our experience, and our knowledge. So maybe somebody can help me understand what is maybe more deeply met, meant and not so clear that the solution is in the problem. Okay, uh, anybody? I have, I'd like to jump in here, but I'm looking for something in my notes if anyone wants to jump in first. I'll, I'll jump in briefly. We talked about it before. The one thing, and he's, I think he's specifically talking about it in the context of architecture. He means the, I think he was criticizing the idea of taking sort of a prepackaged solution from somewhere else mm -hmm. as the hammer, and then this must be the nail that, you know, and, and applying it there. So saying, oh, well, the Romans built like this. We have this as a pre packaged solution. Let's just borrow what the Romans built and put it here on top of our problem that we have in the modern world mm -hmm. for designing a, a bank or whatever. Um, and that was sort of the idea of go, going outside of the problem for the solution means going to a pre-existing solution to some other problem developed in some other context. And you see people do that a lot in, the, in, the, in, in their mm -hmm. lives and in, in business and in organizations that they have some pre-existing way of doing things that they've developed and been trained in and have stuck in their heads. And that just gets um, applied to whatever, you know, happened, whatever the news problem has to be, this must be the solution to it. So I think that was the context in which it originally came up, but Mertz, go ahead. Um, Thank you, that's helpful, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I would also, Tom, I, I'm gonna kind of cheat a little bit and, and use somebody else to answer this question for you. Um, we, we discussed briefly here in a different discussion, we talked about Dr. Russell Acoff and his um, concepts on system thinking. And so that's what I would like to point you to. I see um, Sullivan giving us a more kind of internal view of the concept that usually when we're discussing a problem, we are looking at it in Kind of the wrong way right so so we we tend to take our own state of mind for granted and so that traps us into a false sense of belief in what the problem is as it were and so and, and i'm probably doing a 
terrible job of talking about Acoff. Somebody can correct me. But what I, I understand him saying to us is that often the problem merely requires a change of perspective in order, it's kind of like, you know, Tetris. So if you're, if, if you can juggle around the manner in which the question is framed, you can arrive upon the solution. And I mean, obviously we have, you know, resources that we would use, but the seeking of those resources still comes from within you. And that's my interpretation of why it is, you know, why it can be stated that the solution exists within the problem. Uh, anyone, thanks. Can anyone uh, speak more on that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead, uh, Julia. I just even wanted to read um, from, I guess this was a couple of weeks ago, what Sullivan even says about this, because when this came up in kindergarten chats, the student jumps in and says, you, you, you at the very end of this other long essay kind of threw out this idea and what are you talking about? So Sullivan kind of elaborates a little bit more and he starts even by talking about this idea of valuing uh, truths that are universal. He says, I I've come to regard as valuable those truths only which are universal. And is it a bit surprising to note how many truths are universal or maybe expanded into your universal application? I don't suppose that anyone who succeeds in solving a problem really goes out of it for the solution. And this assumption doubtless also accounts for innumerable failures. And the failures certainly are self-evident. The world is filled with debris of this sort. Particularly is this characteristic of the intellectuals. The unsophisticated man is often better qualified to go straight to the core of a matter by a process of feeling to sense its reality. Now, to give a very simple case, if you are given a peanut pod and the problem is to find the peanut, you simply open the pod and there is your peanut. The conditions are extremely simple, but the truth is there. The germ of a universal truth, which with sufficiently extended experience will formulate itself into an axiom or what scientists call a law. For to scientists, truth, truths are laws in which little word you may incidentally note the survival of an autocratic notion of the universe. If we gradually enlarge our problem, we find its husk of conditions becoming complicated and its contained germ of solution less and less obvious. But when we have solved our problem by confining our attention to it, we find the quote law holds good. And when we have had further experience, we become aware that the very nature of the limiting conditions suggests to us what must be the nature and the limitations of the solution. If you are searching for a peanut, you come to know by experience that you will not find it within the burr of a chestnut. Thus, a given problem takes on the character of individuality, of identity, and you become aware that your solution must partake of that identity. If you come across a problem which does not possess an identity, you know by such token that the problem is not a problem, but a figment. As the problem becomes more complex, it becomes the more necessary to know all the conditions, to have all the data, and especially to make sure as to the limitations. So I would hear what Sullivan is saying is, is kind of agreeing with, with what you're saying, Tom, that we kind of need our imagination and our understanding of all the data to figure out what these limitations are. And once we're able to, through imagination or understanding, assemble all of those conditions and limits, that, that, will, that our, our solution is going to be within those limits. That's what I hear him say. Uh, thanks, Shreya. Next up is going to be Chris. Chris, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, this is somewhat of a wonky question, but maybe has a deeper kind of uh, philosophical point within it and, and ties even to something Joya just said about the, the problem in, within or the solution within the problem. But um, I liked the I loved the, the chapter on ornamentation and architecture. It's a question I think about a lot, um, given my own architectural background and, and uh, interests uh, in design about kind of what is the proper balance between the two and how to use ornament uh, in the right way, if you will, quote unquote. And I found his description while he, while he gets close to, I think a better articulation of what he means when he says things like, it should be something not as something receiving the spirit of the structure, but as a thing expressing that spirit by virtue of differential growth, statements like that. Um, you know, he's, he's obviously trying to, to come upon, I guess, a something like a rule or a universal. And so I wonder um, for anyone kind of uh, on, the, 
on the discussion group if they have any thoughts on this question of is is this really Sullivan just kind of working out his own personal subjective style and kind of justification for for his use of ornamentation or is he trying to get at some deeper more universal rule if you will about kind of the relation between structure and ornament and kind of what that says even about the creator's uh, process, if you will. Um, yeah, I can, I can touch on this idea. Um, I think a lot of people read Sullivan as he's working out justification for his own ideas. Um, but if you read carefully through it, you hear him repeatedly threading through all of the essays um, that it's not that he is, is putting his ideas forth. He actually comes out, did you find that spot? It's this one, um, about the leaves of the tree. Yeah, I mean, this, this um, he, he comes out many, many times about how important it is that these are individual, these ideas, these element of ornament, how much, how it's used, the way that it's used, that it always comes individually. It comes from each individual person, their own poetry, their own ideas, the germination of the problem. Um, and um, we've already read this section already, but uh, which is, where, where do we start I, sorry, here? I don't know if it is Kurt here. Oh, this is from the just subordination in architecture design. And he says here, for I do not know that it has occurred to anyone to ask what is the just subordination of leaves to the mass in a tree. Um, and I, I love, and thank you for reading this, uh, Joya. I absolutely love this line too. And yes, Mertz, I was expecting you to pull on this one. So I didn't touch on it earlier. <laughs> we're all just saying if it's trees, we're going to let Maritza take it. <laughs> but, um, but let me, I, I love this because if you, if you listen carefully, what you're hearing is, you know, at the very first time we talked about Sullivan, I talked about his, his biting sense of humor, which I find really funny. This is, this is Sullivan telling somebody who asked him this question about, whether you sub sh should subordinate one to the other. Um, he points out um, uh, how he thinks, uh, how, how much he thinks the question is- Is, is, is a stupid question. A stupid question. <laughs> Not that yours is, yours is a different yeah. question. You know, no, so make, let me make that clear. But what he says here is um, what any, um, oh, let me turn this so I can read it. Two parts of the book here. What are the just ratios of leaves, branches? Oh yeah, what are the? Yeah, you were right. These these lines are a little long. Yeah. Um, what are the just ratios of leaves, branches, and trunk? <laughs> oh, should the leaves be large and hide the branches as the horse chestnut? Should they be frivolous and dainty things? Um, because it, this is uh, I think what you're getting to is. Um, for my part, I found a thousand ways yeah. all charming and fruitful in suggestion. I graciously permit them to grow as they will <laughs> and look on with boundless admiration. So he's really looking for individuality in oh, ornament gosh. and mm -hmm. in, in all of this. It's, uh, and he's, he's almost begging us to do our own thing and to flourish as each of us would naturally flourish. Um, the other thing I would add is I would recommend this book. They Sharon, can't see the title I though. Have this, I, I actually have this book as you can see. This. But we can't read the title. Uh, There's no title there. No, it's it's golden letters embossed, so it doesn't show properly. It's a it's 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 a book called A System of Architectural Ornament by Louis Sullivan, where he mm. goes and talks in detail about this so for example yeah, open it up for us there are some of the plates where it actually shows he actually goes ahead and takes you kind of step by step uh. how architectural ornament uh develops 
uh, and how you know how how he develops architectural ornaments and why, both in words as well as you know these very detailed visual illustrations of how uh, you know what he means by it. So I would recommend that. Um, now, you'll but, notice Srikant has um, a very large portfolio version of it, which is a very hard thing to come by. So for <laughs> I don't know how many years, maybe twenty some years. <laughs> I begged him to bring it when he comes to visit. <laughs> and I'm convinced the reason is because he's expecting when he gets it inside my house, it'll somehow mysteriously disappear when he's ready. I, to am am I home. unreasonable? Am I unreasonable to expect that? Is he unreasonable to expect that one? <laughs> no. Nah, not at all. <laughs> it'll be tactically relocated <laughs> to my <laughs> shelf. <laughs> you can come um, back and visit it. Yes, of course, of course. Can, um, I, um, can I jump in here for a second? Yes, please. I have a, a last second ago thing. So, so everyone's talking about my lack of bringing up that tree example. So I, I purposefully didn't bring it up, even though I did highlight it, because um, he was, I, I did catch that he was naysaying the concept that I thought was more important. Um, but I, I am going to provide a slightly tangential um, story here. And actually, I, I, I don't know if I could get it easily. So I was recently, I was just in um, Curaçao, which is a, um, it's a little island that's a part of the Netherlands kingdom. And I, you know, have a fascination with trees. So, you know, we walk along and, you know, Ash is pointing out food places and really cool things. And I'm like, look, the trees. But um, they have a tree there that the fruit it's not grown through flower and it's not on the, the stem or the leaves. It's attached to the actual branches. It looks so odd and so wrong. And I'm like, what the? And worse, the absolute most offensive part is that the fruit is not edible. But it looks really cool, but it's crazy. And you're like, what on earth, nature? What were you thinking when you did this? So I'm still, I have yet to find what the um, evolutionary path is to having made this tree, but um, it's what came to mind when when you know Chris was was asking about this the ornaments, and I'm like, that tree there makes me wonder if uh, the ornamentation was necessary for that tree. Well, I, Go ahead. I, I want to just add one thing to what Chris um, asked. So what Louis Sullivan is saying in this book is there are universal truths and universal laws. So form follows function is universal. And then within that structure, you have a lot of freedom to do the ornamentation. And that's where the individuality comes across. Uh, again, I'll bring it back to Montessori because we call it freedom within limits. And so your limiting uh, framework is the universal truth and then within that, you can create a lot of variations. Next up is Ash. Yeah, um, hope you can hear me okay with the background noise. But yes. uh, so I, I don't really have a question per se, but just a couple of observations on this discussion that's going on um, about the, the variation and the different kinds of trees and is there, are they right or wrong or what's the best way? Um, so I, I think it's interesting how you know everyone in this discussion kind of brings their own background and perspective to what Sullivan is writing about. And um, so you know, early on in our meetups on the kindergarten chats, you know, my original background was in philosophy, and I, I had brought up that uh, his idea of form follows function seemed very uh, reminiscent of Aristotle's theory of causation, particularly the formal and final causes. And, and Shrikant, you had mentioned that you thought it was actually more directly uh, drawn from Darwinian evolution. And, and so now I'm in Galapagos, so I'm reading it with that in the back of my mind. And, and I think that comes through very clearly, even in like this earliest essay on the characteristics and tendencies of American architecture. Uh, so like, he has passages in here about, uh, you know, like a new species of any class, a national style must be a growth. That slow and gradual assimilation of nutriment and a struggle against obstacles 
some necessary adjuncts to the verbalized processes of growth, and that the resultant structure can bear only a chemical or metaphysical resemblance to the materials on which it has been nurtured. Um, or uh, like later in the same. Ash, can you move your mic? Uh, Ash, can you move your mic closer to your mouth? Can you not hear me? Yeah, this is. Sorry, not sure. Okay, sorry. So, yeah, and then he, you know, later he says the law of variation is an ever-present force, and coordination is its goal. So, like, this is a very, very profound integration of Darwinian thinking. Um, it, he has this very subtle and deep grasp um, that he's applying. You know, not just to biological uh, evolution, but to cultural evolution, like the growth of architectural style in the new context, which he, to him, there's not like a, a strict distinction between the two. He views this higher level cultural evolution as a sort of subcategory and special case of, of uh, biological evolution. And yeah, so it's just really fascinating to me. And so, sorry, I can't remember exactly where I was going with this, but I don't know, just like being here in Galapagos is just, I think if he had seen this place, you know, he would have looked at the amount of natural variation in, in the flora and fauna here and the in, in a relatively small geographical area and, and the uh, the degree to which that variation exhibits uh, so clearly this idea that form follows function, uh, he would have been like a kid in a candy store here. Uh, so I, oh, uh, yeah, so the other thing I was going to mention though about how he's applying this at this cultural level, it's, it's like he anticipated, you know, this nascent science now that we call memetics, like a century ahead of his time. Uh, and I think viewing it from that perspective can shed some light on his thought, um, not only to how he views the development of architectural style, but also to issues like his concept of democracy. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to put that out there because I think that, that is maybe one other perspective in which to read this that might be... Uh... Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. Um, so Ash, uh, I wanted to say one thing, uh, you know, talking about kid in the candy store in Galapagos. Um, I remember from Darwin's autobiography when he landed in South America, he was a big fan of Beatles. He had been collecting Beatles all his life. He ends up and he, you know, ends up on the shore there and looks down, it just looks down and there are like 12 different species of Beatles that he has never seen before. Now he has only two hands. So he grabs some of the beetles and one of the beetles, he's, he has no place to put it. You know, he's run out of all places. So he sticks it in his mouth <laughs> and the beetle, you know, emits this bitter, uh, you know, liquid and he has to spit it out. So I, I, I remember that, that story as just seeing the just tremendous variety in, in the tropics as, as a background. Yes, Sesh. Yeah, I love that story. And um, like other biologists have mentioned the same thing since, you know, in the South American rainforest, like I think E.O. Wilson talked about his first visit where he would see in like one square foot of ground more different species of just ants than he'd ever seen anywhere else in the rest of the world combined. <laughs> so it's, it's incredible. Yes, and what it does, and the thing that um, Louis Sullivan does is that he captures that fecundity of nature, you know, and he is, he has this, he's in tune with that. And he's, he's saying, look, that's what nature can do. Why as a human being, are you beneath that? Why is that not your standard? You know, it's, that's, that should be a starting. Yeah, that, that does actually bring up, I guess, a question that I could uh, pose here, which, so he does have a passage in that essay where he's talking about, he's making this analogy um, of uh, architectural style to literary style, which is kind of the one area of American art that up to that point had received some serious uh, discussion. And he talks about it in terms of it being exquisite, but not, not virile. Uh, so I think, you know, it hadn't reached that kind of stage of fecundity and, and um, having so much variation that 
for selection to kind of operate on for like a, a unique national style to emerge from yet. So I, I'm just curious if anybody has any thoughts on, on what exactly he meant by that or the relationship between, you know, what he calls the exquisite uh, and the virile in, in uh, artistic style. I have some thoughts about that <laughs> um, to share because honestly, this, this was a big question to me as I was reading this chapter to, to, to ask what exactly is he talking about? Because if he's writing this in the 1880s, so I, mean, I can tell you even from my background as someone who studied the history of American literature, uh, you know, 20th century scholars have now looked at the 1850s and they call this the American Renaissance. It is, you know, the American Romanticism period. It's the period that's characterized by Emerson, Thoreau, uh, Herman Melville with Moby Dick, Nathaniel Hawthorne with The Scarlet Letter and all of his books, the poetry of Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson. And so there was definitely a, a real true, I mean, we scholars don't even call this the American Romanticism era. But I think reading then what Sullivan, how he's describing the literature, the interesting thing about the 19th century was while all of these great authors that we've all now heard of were, were doing their writing, there was also a very, the, the literature that was popular in that day. There were the, one of the most popular novels at the time was probably something nobody now has ever even heard of. It was a, a novel called The Wide, Wide World by Susan Warner. Um, and I've never had to read the whole book, but there was a whole, uh, like the most popular books of the time were these sentimental books uh, written by women for women. Um, it, it was a, a so the, the, the wide, wide world story, which I've never had to read, but my understanding of the whole plot was it was essentially the story of this young girl, her mother gets sick. And so she's sent away to live in Europe with an old aunt. And it's, a, you know, she's very emotional. It's all about her tears. And the mother was teaching her about Christianity. So there, there was the, the whole style of that literature was just very focused on uh, like the domestic sphere and women's emotions and faith and, and kind of like the women as the angel in the home idea. And I think that's what he's talking about, sort of the, the rise of that sentimental literature. Um, there was also, it was also sort of the time of melodramatic literature again which like nowadays we never really even read or hear about because it was essentially the popular literature of the time but that just really kind of went for the the cheap kicks or the cheap thrills so that's my understanding of what i think he's talking about i wish he would have given specific examples so we could know exactly what he's talking about but but it was surprising to me to read that to think about but you're writing this after all of these great novelists that we still read and, and consider the great american romantics so I don't really know there. Uh, thanks. Uh, next up is uh, Rupali, you have something to add? Yeah, I, I was just thinking about, you know, how we consume literature more um, as something on a one-on-one -on -one basis as, you know, uh, something you internalize. Whereas architecture is more of living within that structure. And I think the strength and the vigor, the vitality that he means uh, comes you know, he's, he says that that's not yet there in architecture, that you can see uh, that literature has achieved a level of American style or what we could say is truly American, but that hasn't happened in architecture. And I think that the differences in the way we consume literature and architecture. Uh, thanks, uh, Rupali. Next up is Mike. Mike, go ahead. Um, yeah, my question is for the architects. Um, I see architecture as sort of a balance between like all of you having the artist in you that understands design and you can create something in your mind before you draft it. And you also have great knowledge in say structural engineering to make sure whatever it is that you design doesn't, doesn't fall in your head. So I, I, I always, I'm very impressed with people that kind of have a bridge between those two disciplines. So my specific question is, as professionals, do you ever find yourselves out of balance? In other words, designing something that has too much of an artistic uh, flair or, or design, or other times being too technical and structural where what it is that you're producing is not pleasant to look at. Does that ever happen to anybody? I am um, a very, 
quick answer. Sherry, do you want to go first? Uh, no, okay. I, I would say it really uh, depends on the architect's knowledge of the material and the design together because um, yes it could it could be off balance where you can design something too structural or but the thing is um, if you so uh, i have told in the past that i worked with a structural engineer in my career i did not work with an architect and yet i found that the structural engineer had all the elements of beauty because he was very very functional about doing the things and he never really overstructured a structure so over designed a structure with excessive materials so he did have the balance between the the material he knew the technology well and he knew how far he could stretch it uh, for any particular design he knew the the limits of the materials um, I think experimentation is uh, a big part of the process because unless you have tried multiple times, um, you don't know where that um, balance lies between being artistic and uh, out of balance uh, with structure. And I was gonna, um, I, I work independently, so um, I don't, I don't, tend to work with a lot of architect other I don't work in a firm with a bunch of other architects so um but I see that happen a lot I, I'd like to think that I don't have that problem <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing um throughout architecture Sullivan talks about needing this link to to, to tie them together that you usually get one or you get the other and I think that is so common in the field of construction right now so that if you come to the field um and i think i do come to the field with uh, equal footing in the technical um intellectual side and in the emotional side sometimes they people people don't know what to take of that of the fact that you actually it's so rare to see the mm -hmm. two pulled together that they don't know how to take it so um there is uh, and i don't know about other countries but i know in the u.s in the building trades especially in residential architecture um you, you're essentially you're you're either seen as frivolous designer or practical builder and you can't be you can't somehow link design non-frivolous, but good design and practicality. They don't see it's not it's so uncommon as a natural course of the culture that it's rare to find clients, builders um, that, that see the two are supposed to be linked. So, you know, it's 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 that pervasive still today. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so folks, this is great. Um, next time we are going to do the remaining four essays, but there is one essay in particular. So if you don't read any of the essays, any of these eight essays, there is this one essay that you have to read. Um, Sherry, you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, you, you're on mute. It's my favorite. It's the one that's all green in my book. Um, it's <laughs> It's when the book drops open, it automatically- Sherry, Sherry, when you highlight everything, you highlight nothing. Well, the thing is, I was okay. I was 18. Okay. I mean, honestly, let me show you. That's what I highlighted. Okay, okay. okay. You know, there are a few sentences yes, that didn't get highlighted. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a few. Um, no, this this is my favorite essay. Um, it's It's called The Tall Office Building, Artistically Considered. Um, I, I just, I think it's absolutely wonderful. We could do just a thing on that, but actually the other three essays in this next uh, week are also really, really great essays to, to link. And I love all four of them together. So um, wonderful. I think right. at this point where his, his ideas um, are, are really expressed really well in pithy poetic way. 
Excellent, folks. Uh, so um, thank you very much. I just want to tell you there are two great meetups still remaining this weekend. At 5 o'clock, Chet Richards, uh, collaborator of John Boyd, is going to be here for part two of his interview about his book, Certain to Win. And tomorrow at 2.30, uh, one of the associates of Walter Ong is going to be here, who is going to be talking about orality and literacy. What happens when a culture moves from oral culture to literate culture? And how does writing transform orality? And how does orality transform writing? And what is the secondary literacy that comes in with print? And then secondary orality that comes up with television? And then tertiary literacy and tertiary orality with our internet and YouTube and all these platforms? And how do each of them, what, what are the strengths of the oral, you know, of this conversation? And what are the strengths of the writing? And how do you use both of them together to produce the maximum results? So that's what, uh, you know, Walter on worked on all his life. And this guy, Tom Zlatik, he's a close associate of uh, Walter on. He's worked with him for many years. He's uh, put together his uh, posthumous book where he summarizes all his thoughts. So it's going to be great meet up at 2.30. Eastern time tomorrow. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Bye.